It was a cold Tuesday evening in mid-November, and Bruce Finley was still at his office. He was working on a contract that had to be done by Friday. Finley seldom procrastinated, and he was confident he could have it finished as early as the next morning. He neatly stacked the files he'd used and slipped them into the modern-looking mahogany cabinet behind his desk chair. He then locked it. Finley was in his late thirties, fairly tall, almost six two, and slim. He had a pale, somewhat angular face. He pulled on his suit coat, then his cashmere top coat. His wardrobe was a bit more expensive than his income could justify. He ran a comb through his straight, thinning blonde hair and headed out the door. As he took the elevator to his parking level, he thought about his kids, both middle schoolers, and his wife. For weeks, Adam and Julia had given him happier thoughts than his wife, Bridget. God, she's been such a witch lately, he muttered to himself. He thought about the sexy blonde waiting for him at the Hilton, and his mood brightened. He smiled in anticipation. He remembered how hot she'd been the week before. She was tall, with good legs and a great body. She was a few years older than him, but God, she was hot. He'd never had anything like hers. She really got into it. Jesus, did she have a hot body? She could almost squeeze him off without him moving. But then, what fun would that be? He chuckled softly to himself as he headed down the dimly lit, 80-foot parking ramp to level 4, looking forward to the coming two hours in suite 606. He strolled leisurely towards his car, through the shadows of the ramp. His eyes turned downwards, and his mind was far away. It's just as well Bruce Finley wasn't paying attention. Awareness would not have helped him. It would have only added a few seconds of needless panic before his happy, everyday life would be rocked to its core. Ung! He grunted as something smashed him viciously between his right cheekbone and nose, jolting his head violently to his left. He felt the sickening snap in his nose. He reeled further to his left, away from a large concrete support pillar. Clinging to a glimmer of awareness, he felt himself being spun around, and his back slammed violently into that same pillar. The next blow hammered into his solar plexus. The impact stunned him, and his mouth fell open as if in a gasp. If he only could gasp, he couldn't breathe. Doubly shocked now, from the blow to his head, and his suddenly paralyzed breathing apparatus, he had no chance to ward off the fierce kick launched upward into his crotch. The blinding explosion of pain hurled him into the darkness. He never felt the follow-up punch, the one that battered his other cheekbone, and split the outer part of his eyebrow to the tune of, say, four stitches. Somehow this mayhem overwhelmed him, without giving him a clue to his attacker's identity. He'd seen only a hazy image of his tormentor. He could vaguely make out the shape of a man a bit shorter, but broader, than he was. His first hint of consciousness was the pain. He hurt everywhere, and he moaned softly. He couldn't hear anything. Gradually he became aware of noises. He heard faint traffic sounds in the distance. He was stuck there in limbo for another twenty seconds or so, feeling the dank cold of the concrete floor, when he felt himself being prodded by the toe of a boot. He groaned again and felt more prodding, several sharp pokes in a row. He moaned in protest. Buddy. Finley began to stir a bit, and he could vaguely hear the voice of his assailant. Hey, buddy, you don't look so good. He felt awful, and would soon look worse. His aching testicles swelled as he shivered helplessly on the floor. You feeling better? That darn voice again. Who was it? He wasn't feeling better, aside from the whole consciousness thing. He felt the skin on his face tighten. It would swell like a balloon in ten minutes. By the next morning, it would be an ugly purple mass, and the colors would soon morph into one more or less disgusting shade after another. Ah, your nose looks a little crooked. That's not good. You might want someone to take a look at it. Bruce Finley's senses and brain were beginning to connect with reality the reality that had turned so terribly wrong over the preceding three minutes. He opened his eyes when he felt a warm trickle on his hand. 
he thought it was red. Just how red, he couldn't tell in the dim light. The drips were falling slowly, but from the amount of blood on his hand and on the dirty floor, it must have blowed a lot when he went down. He weakly wiped the black cashmere sleeve of his coat across his nose and bleeding eyebrow. Bruce. That voice was followed by a few seconds interval. Then, Bruce. Wake up, sleepyhead. We need to talk. Funny, the voice didn't sound hostile. Now it sounded light and airy like someone encouraging him. Encouraging him to do what? What? What I want? It would take three more minutes before he could speak coherently. His stomach suddenly revolted, and he began to vomit. While he retched, repeatedly, almost nothing came out. That's right, he'd skipped lunch. Finley was laying on his side but could raise his head. He flinched, bringing his forearms up in front of his face, when he saw his attacker step towards him. The man roughly slapped his arms away and with his two gloved hands grabbing Finley's coat, yanked him to a sitting position against the pillar. Hey, jerk, do you know who I am? What's my name, Finley? His voice was no longer light and airy. It was harsh, loud, and contemptuous. Finley's very name sounded disgusting and foul. Hearing his own name again finally startled him. He was not just some nameless victim. Knowing that he, personally, was the target of this brutality spun his mind into another whirl of confusion. Why? His focus returned when he felt the sharp slap, delivered by his tormentor's right hand. He raised his sleeve again to wipe at the blood dripping down his cheek. Bruce! Bruce! Wake up, you stupid weasel! Can you hear me? The voice was again harsh and insistent. The man stared at his victim with coldly focused attention. He knew Finley was an okay lawyer for a decent law firm in the city. He made good, but not great, money and had a family. He wasn't a really bad guy. He did have an outsized sense of entitlement. As with most attorneys, it came to him as if a part of his diploma upon graduation from law school. And of course, he cheated on his wife. Bruce. Do. You. No. Who. I. Am. The words came out slowly, as if directed at a small child. The tone grated in Finley's head. Finley approached full, if painful, awareness. With effort, he directed his attention to the man's face. He was a normal-looking guy, a bit better-looking than average, square-jawed, with wavy, dark brown hair and eyebrows. His eyes looked dark, but then they were in a badly lit parking garage. He was six feet or so, and even covered by the wool jacket he wore, he looked very athletic and powerful. Finley had never seen him before in his life. No, no, I don't think. Who are you? His words were still slow and slurred. Are you sure, Bruce? Are you sure you've never seen me before? Not even in a picture? The stranger's look was angry and impatient. I don't think so. No, I haven't seen you before. He spoke more clearly this time. He looked at him, desperately trying to find some association, some reason to remember him. The man shook his head in exasperation, perhaps disbelief. That's too bad, Bruce, if someone's going to do something like this to you. He gave a vague wave of his hand towards Finley indicating his general condition. If you're going to get the heck kicked out of you, you should at least know why, don't you think? Finley looked dumbly at the man, not knowing what to say. He watched him pace back and forth for a minute or so. His olive skin, a bit tanned, was far from pale, but his grim expression darkened him even more. Bruce. He suddenly roared Finley's name at his cowering victim. The ramp was then silent. No echo in here tonight, is there, Bruce? He paced some more, restless as a hungry predator. There are actions, things that you do that cause echoes, Bruce. He virtually spit out Finley's name. For good or ill, they will bounce back at you. Tonight is your echo, Bruce. I am your echo, and I am enjoying it. Think, Bruce. Think for a moment about why someone would want to do this to you. Can you think of any reason? 
Have you done something bad at work? Something that really pissed someone off? Is that it? No, no, nothing at work. No, nothing there. Every word came with difficulty. The chaos in his brain again slowing his speech. Really, Bruce? His voice was low and rough. There isn't some guy out there who thinks you screwed up his case. Are you sure? No, no, Finley mumbled and shook his head. Well, his interrogator paced in frustration for a good twenty seconds. How about your wife? Do you think Bridget could be mad enough at you to hire me? Would she pay me to deliver this little message? Bridget, how do you know? His question died in midair. He was momentarily silent under the blank stare of this stranger. He resumed haltingly. She gets mad sometimes. He offered cautiously. But she'd never do this. Besides, I haven't. His voice trailed off into nothing. The man chuckled softly, as if in sympathy with his victim. No, I don't think Bridget would hire anyone to do anything like this. I agree with you. She is a real witch, though, isn't she? You almost have my sympathies. Dealing with her must be a real chore, a real pain in the bum. You look confused, Bruce. You know, I really know a lot about you and your family. Lovely kids, by the way. You should be proud of them. But I suppose you already know that, don't you? The man took a deep breath, paced a few steps, then returned to stand directly in front of him. He looked down at Bruce in annoyance. Well, Bruce, it's not your job, and it's not your wife. What have you done that could piss someone off this much? There must be something. What is it, Bruce, that could make someone this furious with you? The tumblers in Bruce Finley's muddled brain finally fell into place. Oh, crap, he whispered. Carrie. It's Carrie. His heart began to race as he stared at the man who held him at his mercy. You're Jack Hogan. Hogan stared intently at Finley, shaking his head in wonder. I hate to say it, Bruce, but you don't seem too smart. Did you really think it was smart to screw another guy's wife, morality, and such a side, without knowing who her husband was, and what he might do, what he might be capable of, when he found out? Did you really? He smiled with malice as he spoke. No, you didn't think at all, did you, Bruce? By the way, how long has your little sexathon with my wife been going on? I'm just curious. I'm sure I could manage a good guess. But humor me. Hogan's last few words were menacingly calm. Only a couple of months, in early September. Yeah, no earlier than that. Finley spoke softly, as if that would somehow lessen his offense. Hum, Hogan mused. I guess we did nail it down to the beginning. I just wanted to make sure about that. So, you met my wife for sex over a dozen times. Over a dozen times, Bruce. The few thumps I gave you somehow don't seem quite enough, given the enjoyment you had with my wife. Do they? Hogan was quiet for a moment, gathering his thoughts. No, it really isn't enough. I think this will have some further implications for you, Bruce. I really do. Finley felt his innard sink. You do know that Hogan Industries does half its legal work through your firm, don't you? I know we're one of Hamilton Ross' three biggest clients. I'm sure you know that, too. Hogan seemed lost in thought for a few moments. You're going to leave your firm, Bruce. I'm sure you can understand why, can't you, Bruce? Finley's stomach churned again, and he sagged lower against the unyielding pillar. If you haven't left gracefully by the end of January... I'll find a way that's not so graceful. The threat was out there, and Finley had no doubt what would happen, no doubt that he could easily follow through with it. It might be a good idea to find a firm out of the city. It shouldn't be too bad. I hear you're a decent lawyer. You'll get a good reference. Hogan watched Finley as he absorbed Hogan's words. It'll cost you a few years to get back to where you are now, that is. But then... That's the price of ending another man's marriage, isn't it, Bruce? Finley looked up at Hogan, but didn't speak. The reason I don't want you nearby, Bruce, is for your own protection. You see, I'm feeling very vindictive right now. 
I really don't like feeling that way. It's just not healthy for either of us. But if you move, Bruce, then temptation will be out of sight. I won't be tempted to do anything drastic to ease the hurt that the next year or two will surely bring. I don't like being that kind of guy. Bruce, I'm sure you will appreciate that, won't you? Abruptly, Jack Hogan took in a deep cleansing breath, as if preparing for meditation. Bruce, I'm sorry we had to meet like this, but it had to be done, from my point of view, of course. Let me explain what's going to happen. Finley sat quietly, aching and feeling hopeless about his future, hardly able to listen as Hogan spoke. He glanced upward as Hogan continued. You are going home, and regardless of how you explain this evening, and your unfortunate appearance, we have never met. You will go on with your life, carrying this little memory with you, of course. Nothing more will happen to you, not from me at least, for your little dalliance with my wife. Hogan paced back and forth for a few moments, looking at his victim. But Bruce, don't think too much about this evening. Don't be tempted to call the police. That would be a serious error. He was speaking softly by then, like a patient teacher to a student. And you've seen how I deal with serious errors. There will be no physical evidence. In thirty minutes, everything I'm wearing will be ashes. I'll have no marks on me. Even my knuckles won't be bruised. Padded gloves, you see. I will have an alibi and a set of excellent pictures of your last few episodes with my loving wife. Hogan seemed calmer. He spoke softly and self-assuredly as he did each day at his office. Finley sat numbly, thinking about the veiled threat of those pictures. Hogan had thought about sending the evidence to Finley's wife, but decided not to. She would have enough difficult questions for him when he got home. Hogan thought about Finley's kids. They would handle a divorce better when they were out of high school. He was thankful his own kids were off at college. He could deal with that later. Hogan went on. We've established that your wife is a witch. He smiled at Finley as he said it. I can't imagine what she'd do if confronted with the explicit high def in the act proof of your infidelity. It would be frightening. Hogan's grin chilled him. If I have my facts straight, and I do, she also has more money than you have. You have plenty of reasons to stay quiet. Finley looked at him numbly. Any thoughts of revenge were long gone. They'd never even started. One final thing, and our evening will be complete. Hogan glanced at his watch. You need to get a move on to get to the Hilton. You don't want to be late for my wife, do you? What? Why would I see? Finley looked shocked and bewildered. You are going to meet my soon-to-be former wife, as scheduled. She will see what I've done to you, and you won't speak a word of that to her. Will you, Bruce? You won't be staying long, however. You will deliver a message. A very important message, for her at least. First, you will tell her you are never going to see her again. You are going to call her a 304, she hates that word, and a witch. Then you will tell her that you are sorry you ever met her. I would guess that, by now, it's the truth, isn't it? Bruce. Finley didn't respond. Before you leave her, Hogan continued, you will give her these. He handed Finley a large envelope that held three 8x10 photos of Finley and Hogan's wife having sex and a smaller envelope filled to a one and a half inch thickness. He then handed him a passport, motioning for Finley to put both items in the larger envelope. There is some cash and a credit card in the envelope, as well as the passport. There's also a ticket to Mexico City. Hogan smiled to himself, remembering how much his wife disliked Mexico. It takes off at eleven tonight. Tell her she no longer has a husband. Tell her she no longer has a family. She also has no money, other than what's in that envelope. Hogan paused for a moment, as if unsure about what he should say next. Finally, he spoke. Tell her that if she is not on that plane, Lopes will pay her a visit. Make sure she hears that. She will understand. This time I mean it. And Hogan paused for a few moments. Tell her not to come back. Ever.
Hogan took a couple of deep breaths, shedding the tension of the previous twenty minutes. Finley, do exactly what I said. Remember, I'll be watching, he said, staring at the still-sitting attorney. If I ever have reason to see you again. Hogan paused briefly. Well, you don't really want to know. He spoke those final words sadly, as if he truly feared the prospect of a second meeting. With that, Hogan turned and strode briskly up the ramp to the elevator. He pushed the button. It opened immediately. He gave a quick glance at Finley as the door began to close. Finley watched him leave as he sat leaning against the pillar. A minute later, he struggled to his feet and staggered towards his car. He would perform his tasks quickly and exactly as directed. He was cold and tired and anxious to go home. Thanks to everyone who took the time to listen to today's stories. If you enjoyed it, please consider liking and subscribing if you haven't already. Feel free to share your thoughts on the events in the comments below. Take care.